Hello all, welcome back to this course on cryptography, network security and cyber law. This is the continuation of the module 4 which we have begun in the previous session. This is a part of the VTU eShikshana program for the 6th semester computer science students 17 CS61. I am Dr. Padma Shriti. I, I work in the department of IEC in RVC. So in yesterday's class we have seen how we have started off with module 4 and we have seen how wireless LAN security is important. Why is wireless LAN vulnerable? A little bit of background, authentication, etc. So this was the reference book that we are going to use. Cryptography, Network Security and Cyber Law by Bernard Manens which is a part of the Sengage Learning Publication. And uh, we are now here in chapter 15 as a part of module 4. <clears throat> so what did we do in the previous session? So far we have talked about the wireless LAN background. We saw a few terminologies that are very important to understand wireless LAN security. We have talked about a little bit of authentication. What was the status of authentication before WEP came into picture and what happened when we started doing authentication for the wireless LAN using WEP. So till now we have covered so far. What are we going to do today? Today we are going to talk about authentication and key agreement in 802.11i. Authentication, what, how does it happen? What is the key agreement that happens between the various entities in wireless LAN as a part of 802.11i protocol we are going to see in detail. If you have to know the authentication we need to know a little bit about key exchange. To know about key exchange we also need to know about key hierarchy. When once we are familiar with key hierarchy we can talk about the four way handshake that happens for key exchange and authentication. If time permits, confidentiality and integrity also we will be able to cover. Okay, let us start off now with our uh, course. So, so far we have seen how a wireless LAN infrastructure looks like. Right? We know that it has a access point, it has a wireless station and it also has an authentication server. Fine. So we talked about the RADIUS server which most of the organizations implement, a typical organization which can implement a RADIUS server. It can have many different access points, many different access points to which wireless stations, many, many wireless stations are connected to these access points. And all set of these stations connecting to a certain access point will form a basic service set. These basic service set also interact with each other to form an extended service set ESS. This is what we have studied in the previous module, in the previous uh, session. 802.11i makes use of the IEEE 802.1x protocol. Okay. And this 802.1x is the protocol that supports the authentication to happen at the data link layer. So what are the entities that are involved during the authentication? The wireless station that we have been talking about since yesterday is termed as a supplicant for this authentication. The access point that we are talking about to which the wireless stations connect is termed as an authenticator for this protocol. And the server that authenticates the station to the access point is termed as an authentication server. There are many different wireless uh, authentication mechanisms as defined by the IETF. The Internet Engineering Task Force which does many other things also have defined various authentication mechanisms through which through which messages can be exchanged by making use of appropriate protocols for authentication to happen. For message types to be transmitted from one station to the access point, from access point to the authentication server, we require a protocol. 
the most commonly used protocol is the eap which is the extensible authentication protocol this is the most common protocol that is being used we will talk a little bit about extended authentication protocol uh, extended authentication protocol actually even though the name contains the word protocol it is not actually a protocol but it is more of a framework framework consists of software components that can accomplish individual functionalities so this protocol is more of a framework that consists of components that enable request and response coordinations it also contains contains a component for generating the challenge response for the authentication the challenge response is generating the nonce which is required for valid secure authentication of a station to an access point okay so eap is is more of a framework than a protocol the generic authentication mes messages in 802.111i 11i makes use of this eap protocol the protocol that is used between station and access point for communication is a eap that is extensible authentication protocol and the protocol that is used for communication the messages that is extend that is exchanged between the access point and the authentication it actually depends on the server actually depends on the server that is being used so since the previous session we have been talking about the radius server radius server so in our case the server is radius and the protocol here that is being used is the client server protocol which is used for authentication authorization and accounting for all the four services authentication authorization and accounting the radius server is being the radius for the radius server client server protocol is being used our next slide will actually you will actually get to see the message exchange between the station access point and the authentication server we will have to go a little bit slow on this now we will have to clearly see what are the exchange of messages that are happening between the three entities okay now what actually this picture is depicting is the authentication as well as the master key master session key exchange the way it happens in 802.11i okay now these are the three entities that we are talking about the station the access point and the authentication server in which our case in our case is radius server now first what happens a authenticate an access point the station has to be authenticated that is our aim now the access point is going to identify a request okay it is going to ident send a request a uh, identity request to a station in the previous session we have been seeing that a uh, access point can keep polling for all the stations in its vicinity in its range when once it's when once it is going to identify a station which is existing in its range it is going to send a identity request to the station the station should respond back with the identity response it is going to respond back with the identity response and this response is redirected to the authentication server so we are going to send a radius access request to the authentication server because authentication server has the responsibility to authenticate any station to a access point within its range so the radius access request is sent to the authentication server now at the radius server what happens now whatever happens from this point onwards till the server receives a access request 
is all dependent on the type of authentication method that is supported by EAP. We will see many different authentication methods supported by EAP in the coming slide. But till then, you just have to know that what message exchanges happen between the in this handshake between the three entities is dependent on the authentication server. Okay, now the uh, authentication server has now received an access request. The radius is going to generate an access challenge access challenge and it is going to communicate it to the access point. The access point is going to redirect that request, authentication request to the station. The station is required to respond back, respond back to the request. So it responds back with the response, response type message which is forwarded by the access point to the radius server. When once it gets the access request, the radius server gets the access request, then the radius can accept the access. Accept the access. Now, the access point says that, yes, station, you are now authenticated by our authentication server. So, it replies back with the success message. Okay. Now, all these are EAP message types that are being communicated. But what happens at the station level? The station could be connected over a LAN. Correct? Any station, even if it is connected over a LAN, wants to wirelessly connect to an access point, should be able to connect to the, authenticate to the authentication server. So, this station, which is connected to a wireless yeah, to a LAN, to a LAN, exchanges messages in form of EAP OL, which means EAP over LANs. It makes use of EAP over LANs to exchange these messages. Uh, so, this is the actual handshake which happens for authentication. Hope you all have uh, got this. So, we will go to the authentication methods which are supported by EAP. There are many different authentication methods which are supported by EAP. Okay, the first one is EAP MD5. We call it the EAP MD5 because it makes use of MD5 hashing technique. Okay, now first thing, first and foremost thing, when the authentication server challenges the station to submit a password, like we did in the previous slide, shall we go back a little bit? We will see here. See, the server is going to send an access challenge here. You see this? Radius access challenge. That challenge, it is going to ask the station to prompt. It is going to ask the station to enter his password. Okay? Correct? So, when the user enters his password, that password is going to be hashed by making use of md5 technique md5 is message ties just five technique which you would have already studied as a part of the cryptographic algorithm when once the hash is computed for this uh, uh, for this password it is being it is then going to be transmitted it is then going to be transmitted so this is a authentication scheme which is supported by EAP and is called as EAP MD5. What is the problem with this kind of authentication scheme? This kind of authentication scheme, we say that it is insecure. It is insecure in a sense that any kind of eavesdropping can, ha eavesdropping can happen by an intruder. How can he eavesdrop? What does he retrieve by doing an eavesdropping? He can retrieve the hash. He can retrieve the hash. Once the hash is retrieved, impersonification can happen. Hash is the only security that is being given by this authentication method. And once it is retrieved, anybody can log in as somebody else. That is impersonification. And this scheme also does not support any kind of authentication of the access point to station. Access point is merely forwarding messages to the station, but it does not support any kind of an authentication of the 
A B to the station. Okay, that is the uh, disadvantage of this scheme. The next kind of authentication method that is supported by EAP is TLS. This TLS, EAP TLS, let's call it. The EAP TLS is based on SSL TLS. SSL TLS. I hope we are all familiar with it. It is secure socket layer, transport layer security, right? Now, among the other authentication methods, this is the most secure method. EAP TLS. It is the most secure method, and the mutual authentication is based on master session key or MSK. We call it in short. It is based on master session key. Now, this EAP. TLS method requires the AP and the station to have digital certificates with them in order to authenticate themselves to the server. And now you remember, this is the the this kind of a technique was not used in the previous kind of met authentication method. And because both AP and station will have to have a digital certificate in order to authenticate itself to the server. This is required as the. This is supposed to be the most secure kind of a authentication method supported by EAP. Okay. Now, is there a problem with this method also? Yes, there is definitely a problem with this method also. Now, the public key infrastructure that the uh, entities are using will have to be extended to every user of the WLAN. of the wireless lan if there are 100 users in the w lan everybody of those lan every station in that w lan will have to make use of this public key infrastructure and the public key infrastructure has to be extended to every one of the station and this could not be feasible by all the organizations that are going to use this kind of a authentication <coughs> method the next kind of authentication method that we are going to see is called as eap ttls okay it is called as eap ttls it is uh, a little bit similar to eap tls but this makes use of tunneled tls ttls means tunneled tls eap ttls requires certificates only at the ap end at the access point and the certificate needs to be present now the station and the access point in order to communicate with each other in order to authenticate itself the station will establish a tunnel with the access point this tunnel uh, i hope uh, we are all familiar with the concept of tunnel a tunnel is created between two entities in order to in order to use that tunnel as a secure communication channel correct over this tunnel the station is going to transmit a attribute value pair it is going to transmit a attribute value pair the attribute value pair will look something like this the username equals priya Okay, so this is a name value pair which we generally call. Here we call it as a attribute value value pair. That's all. Username is equal to Priya and password is equal to X Y Z. Whatever is the password. This pair we call this name value pair as a attribute value pair where name is the attribute. This pair is now transmitted over this tunnel. okay the station what is happening in this kind of a uh, authentication method is that the station is actually authenticating itself to the server here also the uh, access point is merely sending or forwarding the message to the server therefore the security infrastructure the security infrastructure of the organization is just sufficient to authenticate the wireless clients whatever is existing in the organization the security infrastructure that's really sufficient to authenticate all the wireless clients which are connected to the access point in a certain bss of that organization okay so that's how eap ttls works
the next kind of uh, authentication method is uh, which is supported by eap is eap peap now this is pro proposed by one some of the well established organization that is microsoft cisco and rsa security this is very very much similar to eap ttls it also makes use of a secure tunnel here it makes use of a secure tunnel but this secure tunnel how it is used is different from how it is used for eap ttls the secure tunnel that is used here is used to start a second eap exchange okay using which this second eap exchange is used by the station to authenticate with the server okay you understood this the secure tunnel, uh, tunnel here is used to start a second eap exchange only which for using using which the station can authenticate to the server okay now we have seen so many different security schemes uh, schemes so far shall we just uh, see eap peap protected eap eap ttls tunneled tls eap tls right eap tls which is based on ssl tls and eap md5 okay these are all the different security schemes that we have used all these security schemes that are used with eap makes the eap enhanced eap all these enhanced security schemes they have problems with performance due to authentication overheads so much we will have to keep in mind even though eap supports all these methodologies there is a little bit of overhead okay and there is a degrading of performance that is due to these eaps now we will move ahead with the key hierarchy now where did key come from now what are the keys that we are talking about why we are talking about hierarchy of a key they are the first and foremost thing that we need to know when wlans are sending messages they are encrypting certain codes they are using encryption and decryption techniques in cryptography they make use of keys for wlans for wlans there are two types of keys that are used the two types of keys that are used in wlans are pair wise keys and group keys the pair wise keys are generally they are used to protect the traffic which is generating between the station and the access point the second type of key which is the group key group key is required to protect the traffic that is being generated by the access point and communicated to multiple stations now what do we mean by the importance of pair wise key and group key generally a pair wise key is used for point to point communication or single entity to another single entity communication so that's why we say that the pair wise key is used to protect the traffic that is generating between the station and the access point the group key is a type of key access point which make which is used by the access point all of us know that a single access point is connected to multiple stations now suppose the access point wants to communicate one message to all the stations that are attached to it or that are in its vicinity it makes use of this group key so or a set of stations among this 100 stations that are connected for 50 stations i want to tell something for 70 stations out of 100 i want to tell something as a access point or i want to communicate something to all the 100 stations which are connected to me which are in my vicinity as a access point then the group key is used so basically i mean to say for a access point makes use of group key to use it for broadcasting or multicasting of the messages of the messages so this is the basics of 
the two types of keys that are being used by WLANs. Now we will go ahead and we will learn a little bit of these keys in de detail. Now the keys, the root of the key hierarchy. Now let's talk about the key hierarchy. Now all these keys are arranged, can be arranged in form of a hierarchy. One key is generated from another key. So that is why when we build a key hierarchy, we try to understand which key comes out of which key, where the key is used, how it is being generated. Okay, so that is why we have to build a hierarchy. Every hierarchy is a tree-like structure and every tree should have a root. The root of the tree is a pairwise master key. Okay, a PMK what we call is the pairwise master key which behaves as the root of the hierarchy. This PMK can be obtained using one of the two techniques, one of the following two techniques. The first technique we will uh, talk about is master session key. Okay, the station and authentication server will agree upon a master session key which we call as a MSK as a part of the authentication procedure. The procedure that we have seen in the handshake as a part of that a MSK is agreed upon by the station and the authentication server and it is generated. The authentication server then communicates this key to the access point. The access point and the station, they derive the PMK from the MSK. What is PMK? Pairwise master key. It is derived from MSK. Okay. So, what, what happened with the first uh, kind of method? The station and authentication server will agree upon a MSK, a master session key. And the authentication server will communicate this key to the AP. AP and station will derive a PMK from this MSK. Now, another kind of uh, authentication, another kind of uh, obtaining, obtaining this PMK is by making use of pre-shared key. Making use of pre-shared key. In the previous method where we generated master key, every new session required a computation of the fresh PMK, of a fresh PMK, but here it is not required. We already have a pre-shared key, okay, which can be used as the PMK. A PMK itself is, a, is the PSK. You get the point? So, the pre-shared key can be used as a PMK directly. Let's talk a little bit about this PMK. PMK is the pairwise master key which is a 256-bit key. How does it, how do we get this 256-bit key? It is going to be derived, okay, it, which is going to be used to derive a 384-bit PTK which is called as a pairwise transient key. A pairwise transient key is nothing but a pseudo-random function of the PMK. When you apply this P, uh, pseudo-random function, what we call as the PSR function on this PMK, which is 256-bit, we obtain a PTK, which is the pairwise transient key, which is a 384-bit key. 384-bit key. Now, whatever we have studied in this slide, we can see it pictorially here. Okay. Now, we will finish off the entire complexity of this key hierarchy and then go into detail of this picture. So, in this, let us continue the key hierarchy. So, we have now generated a 384-bit PTK. We have a 384-bit PTK by running a pseudo-random generator function. This PTK is reduced further to three 128-bit keys. Each of these three 128-bit keys have their own importance. The first key is called as the temporary key or the TK. The next key is called as the key confirmation key, which is the KCK. 
the third kind of a key is called as a key encryption key which is the kek so three types of keys are derived from 384 bit ptk each of these three keys that are derived from ptk are 128 bit each okay now why are these three keys used the temporary key or the tk is used for both pro to provide encryption and integrity as a part of security for our wlan encryption and integrity kck is used for integrity protection in the four way handshake which we just went through the four way handshake which we saw had many different message exchanges among the entities it cannot be over the air in actual form it has to be encrypted right the integrity of this messages have to be preserved that is taken care of the key of by key confirmation key which is the kck it provides integrity protection in the four way handshake kek is made is used to encrypt the message which is containing the group key now the group key contains a key right this is sent as a message the group key even though it is used for broadcast or multicast it is a key and it needs to be encrypted that functionality is accomplished by our kek or the key encryption key okay so this is the basics of all the keys that we are going to use as a part of wlan communication so now we will see the actual key hierarchy in form of a tree structure so we will have to go uh, go back and forth be between the previous slide and this slide so we will do it what you see here on this slide is the key hierarchy this is the the figure on the right hand side of this slide this is the key hierarchy now in the previous slide we just told that pmk is the pairwise master key which is the root of the hierarchy correct now we see the root of the hierarchy here in this picture this is the root of the hierarchy now how is this pmk obtained go back to the previous slide you will understand that it is either generated by making use of master session key or it is directly used as a pre shared key msk or psk okay now we see here in this picture msk or psk is made use of to generate this pmk the pmk here the pmk here is now 384 bit right 384 bit and when it derives this 384 bit it is now called a ptk it is now called a ptk the pmk is actually a 256 bit based on the function it is now going to be a 384 bit let's go back okay now pmk is now going to be called a ptk down the hierarchy we come ptk because it is going to extend use itself by making use of the pseudo random random function and become a ptk the ptk further is divided into three keys tk kck and kek which you can see as a part of this slide itself tk kck and kek temporary key key confirmation key and key encryption key get this so this is how the key hierarchy is supported by the by the wlans okay so the next thing is the four way handshake the four way handshake the goals of the four way handshake in 802.11i in 802.11i we will i we will see how four way handshake happens for that first we have to know what are the goals of this four way handshake to derive the ptk from pmk is our goal using this handshake and we also need to verify we also need to 
verify the ciphers which are present in the bacon frames and the associate request frames okay. there are ciphers which are present in bacon and associate request frames which need to be verified and also send group key from ap to the station these are the three goals of the four way handshake we will get into the four way handshake itself the picture is a little blur but i will help you try understanding it it is there in your textbook this picture on page 214 so you can just hold the textbook in your hand and try to understand what i am trying to tell in this four way handshake there are two entities the station and ap you see that there are four handshakes here 1 2 3 and 4 please follow my pointer the first step is from communication from ap to the station ap to the station the next step is from station to the ap the third step is from ap to station back and fourth step is from station to the ap again okay now we will start what uh, start off with the first step the first handshake the access point is going to first send a nonce a nonce to the station that nonce let us call it as na because it is a nonce and n and a because the access point is sending it to the station the station is now going to choose its own nonce ns okay ns let's call it the ns because it is a nonce n and it is chosen by station s nonce s and the station computes the ptk here it is going to compute the ptk at this point how is it going to compute the ptk it is going to apply a pseudo random function a pseudo random function to the pmk along with the nonce na its own nonce ns and it also makes use of the mac address of a that is the access point as well as itself mac address of the station so ptk will be prf of pmk comma na comma ns you can follow this equation ptk is equal to prf of pmk comma na comma ns comma mac a comma mac of s okay this is going to be sent to the access point the access point in turn will return back with a gtk which is a group key which we actually call as a group transient key what is it group transient key this is this message is now going to contain a group transient key along along with the cipher suit and mic which is a message integrity check what you see here is a message integrity check okay it is going to send this key to all the stations this is sent to integrity protect all the multicast or broadcast messages that the ap is going to send to the stations in its vicinity the message 3 also contains the cipher suit you saw the cipher suit there the word cipher suit yeah cipher suit and this is chosen by the access point the cipher suit is chosen by access point the message is encrypted by making use of kek it is encrypted by making use of kek what is kek we just saw in the hierarchy key encryption key so that is why it is in flower brackets and denoted as kek kek okay and sends that entire encrypted message to the station then the last message is nothing but a acknowledgement from the station that it has received the previous message without any error okay now this message the last message after the acknowledgement to the access point from the station now confirms the access point that all the messages from now on will be integrity protected and it will be encrypted with tk what is tk temporary temporal key temporal key right it is going to be encrypted with the 
temporal key. Get the point? Okay. So, this is how four-way handshake happens based on the key hierarchy. I hope you have all understood whatever we have done in today's session. In the next session, we will talk about confidentiality and integrity. Okay. So, let us, before ending the session, let us recollect what we have done so far in today's session. So, we started off with authentication entities. We talked about EAP. What are the handshake messages? That is the master session key exchange. How does it happen in 802.11i? We have seen the handshake. We have talked about the various authentication methods which are supported by EAP. EAP MD5, EAP TLS, EAP TTLS, EAP PEAP, that is protected EAP. We have talked about the key hierarchy which is a very important concept of the entire chapter. Right? So, what are the two different types of keys supported by LAN, WLAN? How can a pairwise master key be generated? What are the two ways of obtaining it? How can it be applied to our key hierarchy? What are the three different keys that are deduced by PTK? What are its importance? And then we have winded up with the four-way handshake. So, in the next session, what we are going to cover is the uh, is the confidentiality and the integrity part, wherein we will talk a little bit about data protection in WEP and uh, how encryption and integrity check can be performed by WEP. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.